Hey friends, I'm Sabrina, the rookie around here. John and Dick are the old school American fans of F1. Thanks for taking time to listen in on a conversation we had about Formula One rookies. It's tough to get into F1. It's even tougher to stay in there. Hopefully, our conversation will not only help you understand why, but illustrate why it's hard for Americans to get into F1. Hope you enjoy our conversation. All right, gentlemen, we now have a conversation that I think is a very good one for new fans of F1 to hear from both of you about rookies. Specifically, I want to help our new fans understand how hard it is to get into F1, how hard it is to stay in F1, and then also in many ways for them to understand why we don't see more Americans on the grid. So let me ask you this first question, Dick. When evaluating rookies, what should new fans keep in mind? Oh, man. You know, it's it's really interesting because there's a, you, you really have to look at where they started from. I mean, most of these guys start when they're four or five years old and they start racing against guys that over time, one of two things happen. They either advance with them from a career perspective or their careers peter out or as I say, OSB, other sports beckon. And so you get these guys who will come up and they start racing in carts And before you know it, you realize that, oh, by the way, pick a driver. Oh, yeah, they they raced with Albon and Charles Leclerc when they were in junior formula cars. And so my point on all this is, is that the cream does rise, even though it is a money driven sport, the cream typically rises and you are judged at the junior levels whether it's karting or, you know, Formula Renault or whatever the case may be, you were actually judged by who did you race against and who did you beat? And what they really are very interested in, what the teams are very interested in is, can I go and acquire a rookie driver knowing that he has beaten driver X and we have data on driver X and this guy looks like he's quicker than data than driver X Does that mean that I can put this guy into my car and instantly go quicker? This is where a lot of this um, evaluation comes in. And while there's certainly a lot of data to support the decisions that these teams are making, there's also a large part of it that's just subjective. You know, I mean, it's sort of like if you think about the NFL combine, right? You know, you've got all these superb college athletes coming in. They've been playing football forever and they have them run the 40 yard dash and they put them through all these different drills and all that kind of stuff. And yet every year, some guys that come through the combine who look amazing, they, they last a season or two and then they're out. Whereas you have other guys that don't do so well and yet they stay in the NFL forever. And it's because they have heart and the heart can't be measured. And so It's no different from racing drivers. Yeah, they don't have a combine to go to, but they're constantly, constantly being evaluated. And so to a large degree, it's what did you drive? What competition were you up against? Did you win races? Did you win championships? And oh, by the way, when you took the next step up, did you handle the increase in horsepower and downforce you would be expected to, because that's the that's the next thing that you want to take a look at is can the kid handle the extra power? And the, the mark has always been that the really great ones always want more power and they excel the more power you throw at them. Nigel Mansell was a great example of this. He was an OK Formula 3 driver, not great, but he was pretty good. And he managed to get himself a test with Lotus. And this was back in the days when cars had a thousand horsepower and he got in the car and instantly went really quick. And he was signed very quickly to go drive for team Lotus. And the reason was, is because he could handle that big horsepower. And of course it worked out that Mansell was absolutely fearless. And that's why he could handle the big power. It just didn't bother him. Those are the kind of things. And again, that's It's an intangible, sort of, but it's also not an intangible. As far as the path that they take, hey, look, today they invariably start in carts at a very, very young age. 
And then they move into something like a Formula 4. If they're successful there, then they'll move into Formula 3, onto Formula 2, and eventually to Formula 1. But it's not necessarily that simple. It's usually not a curve shaped like a hockey stick. It's really going to be more like ups and downs. And there's plenty of times where drivers will go in and for whatever reason, sponsorships, you know, pulling out at the last minute or musical chairs or politics or whatever. And so they may go a season or a partial season with absolutely nothing. And then all of a sudden the phone rings and they have a ride again. It is not something for the faint of heart. Racing drivers are in many respects like actors and that they can be some of the most insecure people in the world because a lot of their professional career is really not in their hands because of the politics and sponsorship dollars. And just the fact that, let's face it, as you get to the upper levels of the sport, you have to have corporate sponsorship to get there unless you have a billionaire for a father. And, and of course, some of these guys do. Boards are very fickle. And if they think that being associated with a racing team is um, maybe something that is not in the best interests from an image perspective or a PR perspective, uh, they'll go and, you know, they'll pull the plug on you really quick. I I uh, approached a, an airline company they they about their air freight business getting involved and sponsoring my racing effort back way back in the day. And everybody loved it, loved it, loved it. Kept going up the ladder. I was starting to feel like I had a deal. And one person says, oh, no, we can't do this because we can't afford to be associated with something that could crash. Devastating, right? Can't argue about it from a PR perspective, but devastating nonetheless. You know, it's those kinds of things that can get in the way of a rookie as they are just resolutely climbing that ladder to get to Formula One. And then once they get there, there's no guarantee that they're going to stay there. That is so many pieces that I think most people who are coming to the sport do not realize. And I'm really grateful that you you were able to break that down in the way that you did because it helps to understand the pressure that the rookies are under, but at the same time to understand that there should be a level of seasoning that has happened over the course of their path to the grid. So yeah. like you have to kind of balance both, give them, it allows us to have reasonable expectations on these drivers and to understand where, especially as the team or the investors who are investing into the team, why they evaluate them the way that they do. So I think that's really good, Dick. John, do you want to add in anything? The only thing I would add is that, and Dick has really laid this out, but maybe not in quite as specific terms. There's a really well-defined pathway to Formula One, uh, which is one of the reasons it makes it hard for Americans to become Formula One drivers. Uh, and that is you start with Formula 4, you go to Formula 3, you move on to Formula 2. As long as you're having success, that's where the people who are who are watching drivers come up the road. Uh, that's where they look. They will look elsewhere, but for the most part, that's where they look. Formula 4, Formula 3, Formula 2, Formula 1. That's, that's the way it goes. Yep. And, you know, I would add here, and just as an interesting sidebar about Americans to Formula 1, you know, last year, about this time last year, actually, there became increasing conversation about the idea of Colton Herta moving from IndyCar to AlphaTauri. And eventually that was shot down because he didn't have the super license points. But if you think about it, here he is, he's running IndyCar. He's he's proven to be a supreme talent, and he happens to be American. And the reason, though, that the Europeans were so excited about Herta, it's not because he's fast in an IndyCar or the fact that he's demonstrated unbelievable car control. No, it's because in Formula 4, his teammate was a, no, none other than Lando Norris. And in the first half of his of Herta's first Formula 4 season, Norris wiped the board with with Herta. And there was a there was a, a break in the season and Herta came home and had a bit of a think and all that. Came back figuring out that he thought he knew where he was losing to Norris. And sure enough, in the second half of the season, Herta outpaced and outpointed Norris. Now, it wasn't enough to win the championship because Norris had such a huge advantage over him in the first half that it couldn't be overcome. But Herta proved that he's got every bit the pace that Lando Norris has. And so that's why those other teams were so interested in him. Wow. 
I did not realize that. That is really good. Okay. So then let me now, if we were talking about how the rookies got to the point and how tough it was to get into F1, let's talk about how hard it is to stay here. What are the metrics of success for rookies? At the end of the day, it's how how do you stack up against your teammate? You know, we've, we've seen it this year. There's been a wide disparity in performance, not only throughout the season, between teams, but it could be as simple as the spare fuel performance from track to track, right? Some cars are track specific. The Red Bull works well everywhere, but I mean, everybody else is kind of like, yeah, I don't think we'll be all that great this this particular race. The question then becomes is, well, how well do they qualify against what is probably a more experienced teammate? And how well do they close the gap from the beginning of the year to the end of the year towards their more experienced teammate? Do they do they pull even with them? Do they pull ahead? Uh, how do they do in terms of race results? And then I think the other piece then becomes, again, coming back to those intangibles, what kind of feedback does the driver give to the engineers? How good of a teammate is he? And I would also say, how good is the guy with sponsors? So there's, there's a, a number of areas, but for sheer performance, the only real choice that you have is to say, how did he stack up against his teammate? Let me ask this follow-up question then. Sometimes it feels like when you were reading or listening to media, they seem to want to compare rookies against each other. Sounds like you're saying that it's not the proper evaluation. It's really against their teammate. Yep. And, and especially knowing that their teammate has been on the grid likely longer than them to see how much maybe the gap is is, if any, that exist? And what is that driver doing to get into the same zone as his more experienced teammate? Is that a fair? Right. About the only thing that you could you could say if you wanted to compare rookie to rookie is to say, well, okay, rookie A has a gap of in qualifying. The typical gap between him and his teammate is a tenth of a second. But rookie B is more like four tenths of a second. That's about all you can do. But even then, you have to say, well, okay, you know, who's rookie A's teammate and who's rookie B's teammate? You know, if I'm a rookie and I'm teammates to Max or Stappen, being four tenths off the pace probably means you're pretty damn good. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Not to mention the car itself yeah. and the team itself. Okay, John. What are your thoughts on what we've been talking about? I'm really with Dick on that to, to a large degree. I do think that there is some value if you're a person like Helmut Marco or somebody else who really understands both the drivers and the cars that they're driving. It seems to me that comparing how not so much their performance against the other rookie, but their race craft. In other words, how are they doing on passing how are they doing on handling the extra horsepower? Uh, are they coming to grips with that as well as the other rookie is? Are they making the same kind of mistakes or are they making different mistakes? How frequent are those mistakes um, among the rookies? Because let's face it, when you move from Formula 2 to Formula 1, the amount of pressure, the amount of uh, demands made on the driver are a whole magnitude uh, greater than, than what they experience at the lower formula. Mm. Absolutely. And so, you know, each person is different. And my thought is, is that there's many times when these young drivers get moved into F1 maybe a year or two early, not because they need more seasoning behind the wheel, but they just need more seasoning in life. Yeah, you're so right about that, Dick. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's a lot, I think, for us as new fans to be considering, yeah. especially, I think, over the different conversations we've had that have been more in the race context and discussing, you know, has this person been on this track before? How are they reacting? You guys are helping to put this in a more encapsulated. John, you had another thought? Yeah, the other thought that I would have is to Dick's point is if you go back and you look at, uh, in particular, Seb Vettel uh, the, on the question of maturity. When Seb came into the sport, he was extremely young. He was the youngest ever at that point. And you can watch and you can see through his development years, if you kind of go back and look at the uh, videos on that, you can see how immature he was. He was really a great driver. He wasn't there too quickly, but he was very immature. And over the next two or three years, he really matured and he came to grips with his 
uh, with who he was as a person, not just as a racing car driver. And I thought that that was an, a really good illustration of what Dick was saying. Yeah. yeah, that's so interesting. You should point to Zeb because I have watched some of the videos of when he started and even just some of his behaviors. I think it was to Lewis and I can't remember who else it was that I if I hadn't known what I see today on the grid and only had watched what he had been like back then, I would have thought they were two different people because mm -hmm. of, as that maturing process, it's obvious happened to the point that when he left last year to see him as like an elder statesman of the sport versus the ki new kid on the block, it, it was it was fun. I think that's what led me down that track. I just wanted to see his career over his tenure inside of F1. Okay. So now let me ask this question. We're getting into the season where contracts are going to be discussed and rookie contracts are going to be the one that are the most, I think, discussed outside of maybe some swaps that could potentially come in uh, different teams. But really the rookies, what did they either coming into F1, what do they generally get? And then also at this point when now it's being at the evaluation of how they have been doing on the grid what do you kind of see in a contracts process and how long is a contract i think it has to do with a case-by-case -case basis you know if you have a driver who's bringing sponsorship money with him that's one thing if you have a guy who's bringing just his helmet and talent that's another thing not to say the guys that are bringing money are not talented they are but there's an extra caveat there that has to be considered. Does the team need that sponsorship money? That kind of thing. And so I think that in many cases, some of these guys come in and it may be a one-year deal. And even then they may not make it to the end of the first season. But then on the other hand, there may be somebody where their agent is able to cut some sort of smoking deal. And it may be a two or three year deal, which for a rookie, that's a long contract. The, the team has to be really convinced that they're getting themselves a lot of potential, you know, a lot of potential upside, I should say. Yeah. And I would add to that to say that a contract is a contract is a contract until it's not a contract. Right. And, and there are always very, very carefully written escape clauses for both the driver and for the team uh, in these contracts. There is absolutely no such thing as a standard contract for a racing car driver. Well, you know, the lawyer in me says that's very fascinating and want to go learn about that just in and of itself. But we won't subject our listeners to my personal interest on that. They they may not want to go that way. But this is good. Guys, do you think there's anything else that we're missing to be able to share with our new fans who are listening? I think that a new driver, if they do bring sponsorship, so let's say... Um, if, if a new driver brings a, a really good sponsor who brings a lot of money to a team, that can make a huge difference in how well the team then is able to perform. And it makes the driver look better, but it really does improve the team's standing. And uh, at the end of the day, that's what the uh, that's an ideal combination for a uh, for a team. Yeah, I, I go along with that. Okay, well then I will wrap up our conversation on the rookies and what people should know when evaluating rookies in the F1 grid. I look forward to case study conversations where we're going to look at each of the drivers that are on the current grid. Okay, friends, what did you think of this conversation? Did you know the information about how to evaluate rookies that Dick shared? What about the road to F1 that John shared? The guys and I want to know what you thought of this conversation. Drop me a line via email, sabrina at twoguysagirlandf1.com. Stay tuned for upcoming episodes. We're going to discuss each of the current rookies on the grid. Consider them case studies of the principles we just shared. Are you following us on social media? We're in all the usual places. Follow us. Thanks to those who are sending messages and comments. Feedback from you, our listeners, our two guys, a girl in F1 community has been humbling and really encouraging to John, Dick, and me. We know that this is a crowded market. So your words have been and continue to help us build a community and content that we believe in. Thank you. Based on your feedback, we know that if someone hears us, they stick around. 
So we need your help to get higher in the podcast rankings. Please take a moment to rate and review us in your favorite podcast app. Continue sharing our show with your fellow F1 fans. It's listeners like you that are making this podcast a success. It's your endorsement that helps us build the two guys, a girl and F1 community. Maybe you're new to the podcast. If so, check out our earlier episodes where John, Dick, and I share our F1 origin stories. And if you're a rookie to F1, then check out our F1 101 episode. Consider it a primer, the tip of the iceberg. And thank you to our followers who are supporting the show. You are making this show possible. John, Dick, and I don't take it for granted. If you're not a member already check out the support the show link in the episode notes. And with that, let me say that ends this conversation, but rest assured, we'll keep talking and you can keep listening in because we're just two guys, a girl and F1 for John, Dick and me, Sabrina. Thanks for listening.